Brian Delroy hit the man, a powerful punch square in the face. The impact sent the man reeling, and he fell to the ground, clutching his nose as blood started to seep between his fingers. The scene had escalated quickly, but it had all started just a few seconds earlier. Brian and his wife, Michelle, were at the bar celebrating her new job. Michelle had been showing Brian her new business card, her eyes alight with excitement. They had been chatting animatedly, Brian basking in her happiness, when the burly man at the bar took notice of them. He was large, with a heavy-set build and a menacing air about him, and he had clearly had too much to drink. Without warning, the man lumbered over to them, his gaze fixed on Michelle. He made a lewd comment, his words slurred and his breath reeking of alcohol. Brian's muscles tensed, but he tried to ignore the man, hoping he would lose interest and leave. Michelle, ever the professional, managed a tight smile and continued talking to Brian, but the man didn't leave. Instead, he picked up a beer glass and hurled it at Michelle. Brian saw it happen in slow motion, the glass arcing through the air, Michelle's eyes widening in fear as she ducked just in time. The glass shattered against the wall behind her, sending shards flying. That was the moment Brian snapped. Rage surged through him, a primal need to protect his wife. He crossed the distance between them in a few long strides and swung his fist, putting all his strength behind the punch. The man's head snapped back and he fell to the ground, clutching his nose, blood dripping onto the floor. The bar fell silent for a moment, patrons turning to see what had happened. Then the murmurs started and the atmosphere grew tense. Michelle grabbed Brian's arm, her voice shaking as she urged him to leave. We need to go, she said, her eyes wide with fear and concern. Brian, his hand throbbing from the impact, nodded. They made their way toward the exit, the crowd parting to let them through. On the way out, Brian accidentally bumped into a young bar employee. The boy, barely 15 and dressed in an oversized uniform, stumbled back, eyes wide with fear. Brian, still fuming, snapped at him. Watch where you're going, he yelled. The boy mumbled an apology, but Brian was already moving on, his thoughts a whirlwind of anger and regret. Outside, the cool night air did little to calm his nerves. They walked in silence, the city centre bustling with evening activity. Michelle finally broke the silence. You shouldn't have done that, Brian, she said softly. Brian's jaw clenched. He threw a glass at you. What was I supposed to do, just stand there? I know, she replied, her voice gentle. But now what? What if the police get involved? Brian didn't have an answer. He just squeezed her hand, trying to reassure her and himself that they would be fine. They continued their walk, the city lights casting long shadows, the noise of the bar fading into the background. Later that evening, Brian tried to focus on his work. He had quit his job eight months ago to start his own marketing agency, and it was finally starting to pay off, bringing in a steady income. His office was his sanctuary, a place where he could immerse himself in projects and ideas. The soundproofing was so good that he often joked he wouldn't hear a tank rolling by outside. But tonight, even the thick walls couldn't keep out the nagging thoughts of the bar fight. He sat at his desk, staring at the screen, his mind replaying the events over and over. He was startled out of his reverie by a message from Michelle. It was urgent, and she rarely interrupted him while he was working. Brian's heart skipped a beat as he read the urgent message from Michelle. He left his office, his sanctuary of calm, and made his way to the front door with a growing sense of foreboding. As he opened it, his worst fears were confirmed. Standing on the doorstep were two police officers, their expressions stern and unreadable. Brian Delroy, one of them said, you have been reported to the police for inflicting minor bodily harm, namely breaking the nose of a Mexican citizen. Brian's mind raced. The man he had punched in the bar, he felt a surge of anger and frustration. Did you even check the cameras? That man threw a beer glass at my wife, he protested. The officers exchanged a look, their expressions remaining impassive. You'll need to come with us to the station to sort this out, one of them said, his tone leaving no room for argument. Brian turned to Michelle, who stood behind him, her face pale and anxious. I'll be back soon, he promised, though he wasn't sure if he believed it himself. He gave her a reassuring squeeze on the arm, trying to convey a confidence he didn't feel. The ride to the police station was a blur. Brian sat in the back of the squad car, his thoughts a whirlwind of anger and worry. 
He had no regrets about protecting his wife, but now he was being treated like a criminal. At the station, he was led into a brightly lit room with stark white walls. The officers directed him to a chair across from a table cluttered with paperwork. Brian glanced around, taking in his surroundings. The room felt cold and clinical, a far cry from the warmth and safety of his home office. A third officer, this one with a more seasoned and slightly weary air, entered the room and introduced himself as Sergeant Martinez. Brian was about to respond when he noticed the man he had punched at the bar, now sitting in the corner with a smug look on his face. Next to him was his lawyer, a stern-looking woman flipping through a stack of documents. The Mexican man, whose name Brian learned was Javier Garcia, glanced up and immediately pointed at Brian. Yes, that's him, he said in halting English with a thick Spanish accent, addressing his lawyer. His finger jabbed the air accusingly, and a smirk tugged at the corner of his mouth. Brian felt a surge of anger and clenched his fists, trying to keep his temper in check. Why don't you tell them the full story of what happened, you? He stopped himself from finishing the sentence, his jaw tightening as he bit back a racist remark. He could feel the weight of the situation pressing down on him, the urge to lash out almost overwhelming. Before the situation could escalate further, a policewoman stepped between them. She had a no-nonsense demeanor, and her badge read, Officer Ramirez. All right, both of you need to calm down, she said firmly, looking from Brian to Javier. You're behaving like children in kindergarten. Brian took a deep breath, trying to steady his nerves. He glanced at Sergeant Martinez, who was observing the scene with a calm, assessing gaze. Sergeant, you have to understand, this man threw a glass at my wife. Brian said, his voice shaking with frustration. I was only defending her. Sergeant Martinez nodded, his expression thoughtful. We're going to review the footage and take statements from all witnesses. For now, Mr. Delroy, we need your cooperation. Please take a seat. Brian sat down, the tension in the room palpable. Javier and his lawyer resumed their quiet conversation, the lawyer occasionally glancing over at Brian with a critical eye. Officer Ramirez stood nearby, her presence a reminder to both men to keep their tempers in check. Minutes felt like hours as Brian waited, his mind racing with the potential consequences of the night's events. He couldn't believe how quickly everything had spiralled out of control. Finally, Sergeant Martinez spoke up. We're in the process of reviewing the security footage from the bar. We'll need to verify both accounts of the incident. In the meantime, Mr. Delroy, we'll need you to remain here at the station. Brian nodded reluctantly his gaze shifting to Javier, who was now speaking animatedly with his lawyer. He could only hope that the truth would come to light and that justice would prevail. They were told to sit and wait while other policemen retrieved the video from the surveillance cameras. Brian and Javier were seated under the harsh fluorescent lights of the police room, which felt cold and sterile. The walls were a bland institutional grey, adorned with a few bulletin boards, cluttered with notices and mugshots, the air was filled with the faint scent of disinfectant. Two armed police officers stood watch next to them, their hands resting casually on their belts. Brian couldn't help but glance at Javier, who seemed oddly composed despite the situation. Brian's mind churned with questions. How did this man have his own lawyer? Usually people who didn't speak English well crossed the border into the States illegally and lived on small wages, working in small shops or something like that. Yet here Javier was, with legal representation and an air of confidence. The clock on the wall ticked relentlessly, each second feeling like an eternity. An hour and a half crawled by before two policemen finally returned, carrying a flash drive and a folder filled with witness statements. One of them, Officer Ramirez, inserted the flash drive into a computer and opened the video file. Brian leaned forward, his eyes fixed on the screen, the footage began to play, showing the bar from a corner angle. He could see himself and Michelle happily chatting at their table. Then the scene shifted as Javier stood up, beer in hand, and began to walk towards them. Brian's heart pounded in his chest, anticipation and anxiety mingling. Just as Javier reached their table, the screen went black. The time in the corner of the video continued to go, but for six long seconds, the image was just a black picture as if the video had been cut. When the video resumed, it showed Brian storming towards Javier, his fist connecting with Javier's face, 
and Javier falling to the floor, clutching his nose. He hit me, Javier shouted, his voice filled with indignation. I was just taking my beer to the bar to get it replaced with a new one, because there was a fly in mine. Brian's jaw clenched in frustration. Why is there no moment where he threw the beer at my wife? Why is there just a black picture instead of the video? He demanded, his voice trembling with anger. It doesn't show him throwing the glass at Michelle. Officer Ramirez looked up from the computer, her expression neutral. We've interviewed witnesses and bar staff. Everyone unanimously said that you hit the man for no reason. Brian's stomach dropped. He turned to Sergeant Martinez, desperation in his eyes. You have to believe me. He threw the glass at Michelle. This blackout isn't showing the full story. Javier's lawyer spoke up, her tone clipped and professional. The evidence we have suggests that my client was the victim of an unprovoked attack. Unless there's more conclusive proof, we'll proceed with the charges. Brian's fists clenched at his sides, the sense of injustice burning through him. This isn't right, he muttered under his breath. He could feel the weight of the situation pressing down on him, the odds stacking against him with every passing moment. Javier, meanwhile, seemed to relish the turn of events. He sat back in his chair, a smug smile playing on his lips. His apparent confidence only fueled Brian's frustration and anger. Sergeant Martinez sighed, glancing between Brian and the lawyer. We'll need to continue our investigation. For now, Mr. Delroy, you'll need to cooperate with the legal process. Brian opened his eyes wide and started asking the officer a lot of questions. Why was the video cut? Who tampered with the footage? Isn't there a backup? Sergeant Martinez held up a hand to calm him down. We've taken note of your concerns, Mr. Delroy. However, the fact remains that the court has reviewed the evidence available, and you have been sentenced to one day in jail and ordered to pay a fine. This fine includes moral and physical compensation for Mr. Garcia, as well as the cost of his full rehabilitation. Brian's heart sank. But that's not fair. He threw the glass first, he protested. The court's decision is final, Mr. Delroy, Martinez said firmly. You'll serve your day in jail and pay the required compensation. Brian looked over at Javier, who sat with his hands folded in his lap, a look of satisfaction spreading across his face. Javier met Brian's eyes with a derisive smile, which only fueled Brian's frustration. You're an animal, Brian thought bitterly. You're in cahoots with the bar owners. With no other options, Brian resigned himself to his fate. He served one day in jail, a long, agonizing stretch of hours filled with regret and helplessness. The cell was cold and bare, a stark reminder of the consequences he faced for defending his wife. When he was finally released, Brian returned home, exhausted and dispirited. Michelle was waiting for him, her face a mix of relief and worry. She hugged him tightly as soon as he walked through the door. I got all the details from the police, she said softly. This isn't right, Brian. You should file a lawsuit. Brian shook his head, the weight of the situation pressing down on him. It would be a long and stressful process he said wearily. I'd rather pay the fine and be done with it. The fine, compensation and treatment for Javier totaled around $3,000. Brian received the account details from the police and was sternly warned that he was on a watch list for the next year. If anything like this happened again, he would face real jail time. I understand, Brian said, feeling a mix of resignation and determination. He immediately transferred the $3,000 hoping that this would be the end of the ordeal. As he sat down with Michelle, the stress of the past few days finally catching up to him, he felt a sense of relief. It wasn't over, but at least they could try to move on. Michelle held his hand, her presence a comforting anchor in the storm of emotions. We'll get through this, she said softly, her eyes full of resolve. Together. Brian nodded, squeezing her hand. Together, he echoed. Brian returned home and continued the work he was supposed to do a few days earlier. He sat at his desk, the soft glow of his computer screen casting a familiar light in the dim room. The project he had been so focused on before the bar incident demanded his attention, and he welcomed the distraction. His fingers moved over the keyboard, but his mind occasionally drifted back to the events of the past days. In the evening, he suggested to Michelle that they go out for a walk to clear their heads, she looked up from the book she was reading, dark circles under her eyes betraying her exhaustion. I'm really tired, Brian, 
I've been so stressed and hardly slept the past two nights. Brian nodded, understanding her weariness. I get it. We don't have to go tonight. Maybe tomorrow we can go downtown for a walk, but definitely not near the bar again. Michelle managed a small smile. Tomorrow sounds good. I just need to rest tonight. The next day, it rained heavily all day. The constant patter of raindrops against the windows was soothing in a way, even though the weather was cool and dreary. By evening, the rain had not let up, but Brian and Michelle decided they would still go for their walk. They fetched their beautiful yellow umbrella from the closet, one they rarely used, and stepped out into the rainy evening. The city was alive with the shimmering reflections of streetlights on wet pavement. People hurried by, umbrellas of all colours bobbing above their heads. Despite the rain, the atmosphere was vibrant and bustling. Brian held the umbrella over them both, their shoulders brushing as they walked side by side. They wandered through the familiar streets, enjoying the sound of the rain and the occasional laughter of passers-by. The route they took led them by the place where the bar was located. Brian felt a twinge of anxiety as they approached, but he forced himself to stay calm. The bar was lively, music blaring loudly from inside, and a crowd of people gathered around the entrance, laughing and talking animatedly. Just next to the bar, a small figure caught Brian's eye. A little girl in a black raincoat stood there, a hat on the ground in front of her. The hat was filled with soaked bills, almost floating in the water that had collected in it. The girl looked up at them with wide, hopeful eyes as they approached. Brian stopped and crouched down to her level. What are you doing out here so late? He asked gently. The girl hesitated for a moment before replying, I'm collecting money. My grandfather needs surgery and he's the only family I have left. Michelle's eyes softened with sympathy as she listened. Brian felt a pang of compassion. He glanced at Michelle, who nodded subtly, encouraging him. And now she was waiting for someone else to drop some cash, and then she was going to go home. Brian looked at Michelle, and he could see the emotions playing across her face. She was clearly touched, and it was apparent she was thinking the same thing he was. About four years ago, they were supposed to have a baby. It was a girl, and they had lovingly come up with the name Clara. But during the birth, there was a complication, and their baby was born still. It was a painful and traumatic memory that had scarred them both deeply. As Brian moved away from these thoughts, trying to focus on the present, he noticed a familiar figure leaning against the wall. It was the guy they had bumped into a few days earlier at the bar, the same one who had witnessed the fight. The memories of that night flooded back, the accusations, the unfairness of the situation. Brian remembered that this guy, along with others, had testified against him, claiming he was the one who had started the fight with Javier. Brian felt a surge of anger, but quickly decided to handle it calmly. He made a hand gesture toward the guy, indicating for him to leave. The guy, looking a bit startled, glanced around nervously before slipping inside the bar. Turning back to the little girl, Brian knelt down and asked her in a whisper, How much more do you need to raise? The girl looked up at him with wide, hopeful eyes. I've already raised $800, but I still need about $4,000 more, she replied quietly, almost as if she was afraid to say the amount out loud. Without hesitation, Brian reached into his wallet. He counted out $4,000, the bills slightly damp from the rain, he handed the money to the girl, ensuring to tuck it into her pocket discreetly so that no one could see how much she had. Keep this safe, okay, he said softly, and go home now. Take care of your grandfather. The girl's eyes filled with tears and she sniffled, trying to hold back her emotions. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, she said, her voice trembling with gratitude. My name is Clara. Brian's heart skipped a beat upon hearing the name. He felt a lump in his throat and glanced at Michelle, who had tears in her eyes. She reached out and squeezed his hand tightly, both of them overwhelmed by the coincidence. Clara, that's a beautiful name, Brian managed to say, his voice thick with emotion. Please go home and stay safe. Clara quickly started gathering her things, the relief and hope evident in her expression. Brian stood up, and he and Michelle walked down the street, enjoying their moments together. The rhythmic sound of their footsteps and the gentle patter of rain on the umbrella created a soothing backdrop to their quiet conversation.
The city lights glowed warmly, reflecting off the wet pavement, casting a magical atmosphere around them. Michelle glanced at Brian, her eyes filled with admiration. It was very noble of you to pay the full amount for Clara's grandfather's surgery, she said softly. Brian smiled, a sense of fulfillment washing over him. It just felt right. She reminded me so much of our Clara. They walked a little more, savoring the peaceful night. The rain had lightened to a gentle drizzle, making their walk even more enjoyable. Eventually, they decided it was time to head home. Turning around, they retraced their steps, passing by the bar once again. As they neared the bar, they saw that the girl, Clara, had already packed up her things and was walking about 15 meters ahead of them. She moved with a determined stride, her small figure illuminated by the streetlights. Brian and Michelle exchanged a glance and smiled. They had been dreaming of having children for a long time, but after the loss of their baby girl, they both had experienced severe trauma. It was something they had been working through for years, and the idea of adoption had been a distant but hopeful thought in their minds. Perhaps meeting Clara was a sign that it was time to start making this idea a reality. Suddenly, a mysterious figure dressed in black appeared from around the corner. The figure moved swiftly and silently, grabbing Clara and closing a gloved hand over her mouth to stifle her scream. The whole scene happened in an instant, and then they both disappeared around the same corner. Brian's heart leapt into his throat. Michelle, stay here, he said urgently, thrusting the yellow umbrella into her hands. Without waiting for her response, he sprinted toward the corner where Clara and the figure had vanished. He rounded the corner to find a long, dark passage, divided into two paths by a tall, chain-link fence. The passage was dimly lit, with shadows dancing eerily along the walls. Brian's mind raced as he tried to decide which path to take. He hesitated for a moment, listening intently for any sound that might give away their position. Brian looked helplessly into the darkness that filled both passages and exhaled tensely. He was torn, unsure of which way to go. Go left, a voice said next to him. Brian turned around and saw the guy they had bumped into when they left the bar a few days ago. It was unexpected to see him here, and Brian didn't anticipate any help from him. But the urgency of the situation left no room for doubt. He nodded to the guy and sprinted down the left path. As he ran, a flicker of doubt crossed his mind. What if this guy was tricking him, leading him in the wrong direction on purpose? But Brian was used to trusting people, and he pushed away the negative thoughts, focusing instead on finding Clara. The passage seemed to stretch endlessly, the walls closing in on him as he ran. His breath came in sharp bursts, echoing in the confined space. After what felt like an eternity, but was only a minute, he emerged into a deserted courtyard. In the dim light, Brian saw a group of about six people standing together, their figures outlined against the darkness. Clara was not among them. Brian's heart pounded in his chest as he silently made his way toward a car parked nearby. He crouched behind it, trying to stay hidden while he assessed the situation. As he peered around the edge of the car, what he saw shocked him to his core. One of the men standing there was the same Mexican who had thrown the beer at his wife a week earlier. That damn Mexican again, Brian thought, his anger flaring up anew. The men were talking in low voices, their tones urgent and conspiratorial. Brian strained to hear, catching snippets of their conversation. They seemed to be discussing their next move, unaware of his presence. He scanned the area, hoping to spot Clara, but there was no sign of her. Brian knew he had to act quickly. He couldn't let them take Clara away. Summoning all his courage, he inched closer, using the shadows to his advantage. The rain had stopped, leaving the air thick and humid. The ground was slick beneath his feet, but he moved silently, his eyes never leaving the group. As he drew nearer, he could hear the Mexican giving orders, his voice authoritative and commanding. We need to get out of here before anyone notices, he said in a heavy accent. The others nodded in agreement, their faces tense. Nine. He ducked down and stepped to the front of the car, feeling the cold, wet ground beneath his shoes as he crouched low. The rain had left the pavement slick and reflective, adding an extra layer of challenge to his stealth. Brian cautiously lifted his head, just enough to peer over the hood of the car. His eyes scanned the interior through the windshield first, 
his heart pounding in his chest. The rear windows were tinted, a dark film obscuring any clear view inside. He squinted, trying to make out any shapes or movements, but it was impossible to see through the darkened glass. Shifting his gaze to the front windows, he noticed they were clear. Brian leaned slightly closer, his breath fogging the glass for a moment, before he wiped it away with his sleeve. Through the front window, he could see that the driver's seat was empty. His eyes moved quickly to the passenger seat, confirming it was also vacant. The dashboard light was glowing softly, casting a faint yellow hue over the interior. His gaze settled on the car key, which was inserted in the ignition and slightly turned, enough to power the lights but not the engine. Brian's mind raced. If the key was in the car, it must be unlocked. He gently pulled the door handle, careful to avoid making any noise. The door clicked open with a soft, almost imperceptible sound. He took a deep breath, glancing over his shoulder to ensure no one was watching, then slipped inside the car, moving with the practiced silence of someone who knew the stakes were high. Time was limited. He closed the door as quietly as he had opened it, the muted click barely audible in the oppressive silence of the night. He turned his attention to the back seat, his eyes adjusting to the dim light. There, he saw a small figure huddled on the floor, her hands bound and a bag over her head. The sight made his heart ache. The girl was crying quietly, her sobs muffled by the bag. She hadn't even noticed his presence yet. Brian carefully reached out and removed the bag from her head, doing his best not to startle her. Despite his gentle touch, the girl flinched, a frightened gasp escaping her lips. He quickly placed a finger to his lips, signaling her to be quiet. Her wide, tear-filled eyes met his, and she nodded, her sobs subsiding into silent sniffles. He looked around the car, searching for something sharp to cut the rope binding her wrists. The interior was sparse, and there was nothing immediately visible that could serve as a cutting tool. The urgency of the situation weighed heavily on him as he continued his search, his mind racing with the need to free the girl and get her to safety as quickly as possible. He opened the glove compartment and saw that there was a gun, a real gun. The metallic gleam caught the dim light, its presence both startling and reassuring. Brian didn't hesitate. He picked it up, the cool metal feeling heavy and decisive in his hand. Just as he secured his grip, he heard the faint but urgent sound of screaming coming from outside the car. Instinctively, Brian turned to see what was happening through the back window. His eyes widened as he saw a chaotic scene unfolding. One of the men from the group was struggling to hold on to someone brandishing a yellow umbrella. His heart dropped. It was Michelle. The bright, distinctive umbrella they had brought to shield themselves from the rain was now a beacon, highlighting her peril. Without wasting a moment, Brian jumped out of the car, his movements swift and determined. Hey, look over here, he shouted, his voice cutting through the night air. The man holding Michelle turned at the sound and Brian fired a shot. The sharp crack of the gunshot echoed in the enclosed space of the courtyard. The bullet struck the man in the shoulder and he cried out in pain, releasing his grip on Michelle and falling to the ground, clutching his wound. Brian's eyes quickly scanned the area, locking onto the Mexican man who had caused so much trouble before. He was standing a few meters away from Michelle, a look of shock on his face as he reached for his own weapon. The world seemed to slow down as Brian raised the gun again, knowing he had to act fast. He fired another shot, the recoil jolting his arm. The Mexican man crumpled to the ground, his gun falling from his grasp as he let out a pained cry. The remaining men, realizing the tables had turned, scattered in panic. They fled over the nearby fences, their footsteps fading into the night. Brian's focus immediately shifted back to Michelle. She was on the ground, tears streaming down her face, her body trembling with fear and relief. He ran to her side, dropping the gun and pulling her into his arms. It's okay, it's okay, he murmured, trying to calm her as she sobbed against his chest. His heart ached at the sight of her distress, but he knew they were not out of danger yet. He pulled out his phone and quickly dialed for an ambulance, then the police, explaining the situation in terse, urgent sentences. As the sirens wailed in the distance, Brian's thoughts snapped back to the car. The girl, Clara, was still inside, vulnerable and scared. He gently helped Michelle to her feet. Come on, we need to get her, he said, his voice steadying her. Together they hurried back to the car. Brian opened the door and saw Clara still huddled in the back seat, her eyes wide with fear. 
It's okay. You're safe now, he assured her. He turned to Michelle. Can you take her? Michelle nodded, still shaken but resolute. She reached into the car and lifted Clara into her arms, holding her close. Clara clung to her, finding solace in Michelle's protective embrace. With the sound of emergency vehicles drawing nearer, Brian led them back down the paths toward the public area. The yellow umbrella, now discarded and forgotten, lay on the ground, a silent witness to the night's harrowing events. At this point, Brian began to administer first aid to the victims. He knelt beside the Mexican man, whose face was contorted in pain. Blood seeped through his fingers as he clutched his shoulder, the wound from Brian's shot glaringly evident. Brian's training kicked in, and despite the animosity he felt, his primary focus was on stabilizing the man. He applied pressure to the wound, using his own shirt as a makeshift bandage to stem the bleeding. His movements were swift and efficient, each action driven by the need to keep the man alive until help arrived. Nearby, Michelle held Clara close, whispering soothing words to calm her down. Clara's small body trembled in her arms, but Michelle's presence seemed to bring her some comfort. The scene was chaotic, with the quiet courtyard now filled with the echoes of the night's violence. After about ten minutes, the wail of sirens grew louder, and the first ambulance arrived at the scene. Paramedics rushed out, their faces set with professional determination. They took over from Brian, assessing the Mexican man's condition and quickly loading him onto a stretcher. Another paramedic checked on Michelle and Clara, ensuring they were unharmed. The police arrived shortly after the ambulance. Officers spread out, securing the area and taking stock of the situation. One officer approached Brian, his face stern but composed. What happened here? He asked, notepad in hand. Brian took a deep breath and began to explain, recounting the events with as much detail as he could. Michelle and Clara stood nearby, listening intently as Brian spoke. Once he finished, the officer nodded and directed him to wait while they gathered more information. The bar owner appeared, having run over as soon as he heard the shots. His expression was a mix of anger and accusation. I saw it with my own eyes, he declared to the police. Brian ran in and started shooting at the men on racial grounds. Brian felt a surge of disbelief and frustration at the false accusation, but before he could respond, he was taken back to the police station. There, he endured four hours of intense questioning, the officers pressing him for every detail. He answered as best as he could, but the weight of the situation pressed heavily on him. After the interrogation, he was placed in a detention centre, the cold, impersonal environment adding to his growing sense of dread. The next two days passed in a haze of anxiety and reflection. Brian's mind was a whirlwind of thoughts and fears. He replayed the events over and over, questioning every decision and action he had taken. The uncertainty of what lay ahead gnawed at him, making sleep nearly impossible. When the day of the trial arrived, Brian was led from his cell, his heart pounding with anticipation and fear. He was escorted into a police car and driven to the courtroom. The ride felt interminable, each passing moment heightening his anxiety. As they drove, one of the officers began to explain the charges in detail. Brian, you need to understand the gravity of the situation. You're facing serious charges here, premeditated murder. If convicted, you could be sentenced to life in prison. Brian's heart sank. The words hit him like a physical blow, leaving him stunned. The reality of his situation was almost too much to bear. How could this be happening? His mind raced with panic and disbelief, each heartbeat echoing the fear that now consumed him. The rest of the ride was a blur, his thoughts a chaotic mix of dread and confusion. They arrived, and Brian was taken out of the car and led into the courthouse. The air was heavy with anticipation, and the somber atmosphere settled over him like a weight. Two guards flanked him as they walked through the long, dimly lit corridors, the sound of their footsteps echoing off the walls. As they approached the courtroom, the murmurs of a gathered crowd became audible, growing louder with each step. The doors to the courtroom swung open and Brian was ushered inside. The room was filled with guards, relatives and several journalists, their faces a mixture of curiosity and judgment. The bright overhead lights contrasted sharply with the dark wooden panelling, casting long shadows across the room. Brian's eyes scanned the room and his heart leaped when he saw his wife, Michelle, standing right in front of the entrance. 
Her face was a beacon of hope amid the sea of strangers. He walked up to her quickly, the guards momentarily allowing this brief reunion. He embraced her tightly, feeling a rush of emotions as she held him close. Michelle discreetly handed him something small and cold, an object he quickly realized was a flash drive. The boy we encountered a week ago on our way out of the bar, she whispered urgently, her eyes wide with significance. He made a video. It confirms the girl was kidnapped and that you acted in self-defense. Brian's eyes filled with hope. This could be his salvation. He clutched the flash drive tightly, kissed Michelle on the forehead and whispered, thank you. With renewed determination, he turned and walked towards the front of the courtroom where his lawyer awaited. His lawyer, a composed and sharp looking woman named Linda, nodded at him as he approached. She took the flash drive from his hand, a glint of understanding and determination in her eyes. Brian took his seat, his heart pounding as the proceedings began. The judge, an older man with a stern expression, read out the charges against Brian. His voice was steady and authoritative, echoing through the silent courtroom. Brian Delroy, you are charged with premeditated murder. How do you plead? Before Brian could respond, the lawyer for the Mexican, a tall man with a precise, almost clinical demeanor, stood up. Your Honor, he began, his voice smooth and measured. This was a racially motivated shooting. My client, who tragically died in the hospital, was targeted solely based on his ethnicity. Brian's heart sank as the lawyer continued. This is not the first incident involving Mr. Delroy. There was a similar situation before, where he was arrested for beating my client. This shows a pattern of violent, racially charged behavior. The words hung heavy in the air, and Brian felt the weight of the accusations pressing down on him. He glanced at Linda, who gave him a reassuring nod. Brian stood up, his hands slightly trembling, but his voice steady. Your Honor, may I speak? The judge looked at him over his glasses, considering for a moment before nodding. Go ahead, Mr. Delroy. Brian took a deep breath, gathering his thoughts. This entire situation has been a nightmare, but I want to clarify that my actions were not racially motivated. They were driven by a need to protect my wife and an innocent girl who was being kidnapped. He paused, looking directly at the judge, then around the courtroom. I have evidence that can support my claim. Linda handed the flash drive to the bailiff, who brought it to the judge. This flash drive contains a video recorded by a witness, the boy who saw everything. It shows that the girl was indeed being kidnapped and that I acted in self-defense to protect her and my wife. The courtroom buzzed with whispers as the judge instructed the bailiff to play the video. The video began to play, the screen flickering to life with a slightly grainy image. It showed the girl, Clara, standing under the dim streetlights. Her small frame was hunched against the cold, and she glanced around nervously as she waited for someone to drop money into her hat. The camera followed her every movement, capturing the vulnerability in her posture. A figure appeared from the shadows, moving stealthily towards Clara. The abductor grabbed her suddenly, covering her mouth to stifle her scream and dragged her into the darkness of an alleyway. The camera shook slightly as the boy, the cameraman, hurried to follow them while keeping a safe distance. Brian watched intently, his breath caught in his throat. The video showed him entering the frame, sprinting towards the commotion with urgency. The boy's voice could be heard faintly, instructing Brian to run to the left. The camera then panned as the boy himself moved into a nearby warehouse, climbing the stairs to the second floor. From this vantage point, the entire backyard was visible, illuminated by the few functioning streetlights. The camera zoomed in, capturing the scene below with surprising clarity. Brian was now in the backyard, confronting the kidnapper. Michelle arrived shortly after, clutching the yellow umbrella. The video showed Brian shouting, then firing a warning shot. The kidnapper recoiled in pain, clutching his shoulder where the bullet had grazed him. The tension in the courtroom was palpable as everyone watched the screen. The video continued, showing the Mexican man pulling out his gun. Brian, with quick reflexes, fired a preemptive shot, hitting the man and causing him to collapse. The remaining men fled, scrambling over fences in their haste to escape. The camera captured everything. Michelle's tears, Brian administering first aid to the injured man, despite his own fear and anger, the arrival of the ambulance and the police. The boy's steady hand provided an unbroken narrative, from the kidnapping to the aftermath. When the video ended, the screen went dark, 
and the courtroom was enveloped in silence. Brian stood up, his heart pounding, and addressed the judge directly. Your Honour, the only thing I was thinking about in that moment was how to keep my wife, my family, and this little girl safe. Clara, she has the same name we wanted to give our daughter. Due to complications during childbirth, our child was stillborn. I couldn't bear the thought of losing another child in this world. As a survivor of an orphanage, I understand deeply how valuable it is to have a family. It's the most important thing in the world to me. The judge listened, his expression inscrutable. When Brian finished speaking, the judge remained silent for five long seconds, the weight of the moment pressing down on everyone in the room. The silence was almost unbearable, each second stretching out interminably. Then the judge stood up. He looked around the courtroom, his gaze sweeping over the spectators, the guards, and finally resting on Brian. Slowly he began to clap, the sound echoing in the stillness. It started softly but grew louder, more enthusiastic. One by one, the people in the courtroom rose to their feet, joining in the applause. Journalists, relatives, even the guards, all stood in a spontaneous standing ovation. Brian felt a swell of emotion as he looked over at Michelle, who was clapping with tears streaming down her face. The ovation continued, filling the room with a sense of shared humanity and justice. Brian's eyes met those of the judge, who nodded in acknowledgement. The applause eventually died down, and the judge announced that the sentence was cancelled. Brian was to be released the next day. The courtroom erupted once more, this time in cheers and congratulations. The tension and fear that had gripped Brian for so long finally began to melt away, replaced by a profound sense of relief and gratitude. But most of the bar's staff was detained and imprisoned, including the manager and owner, which forced the bar to close. The once bustling establishment, with its neon lights and constant hum of conversation, now stood silent and deserted. The windows were dark, and a closed sign hung crookedly on the door, swaying slightly in the breeze. The sense of justice brought a new kind of quiet to the neighborhood, a reminder of the events that had transpired. Life slowly started to get better for Brian and Michelle. They found Clara, the little girl they had saved, sitting forlornly outside the hospital one afternoon. Her eyes, once filled with hope, were now red and swollen from crying. They approached her gently, their hearts aching as they learned that her grandfather had not survived the operation. The sorrow was palpable, a heavy weight that seemed to settle over them all. Clara's grief was profound, her small body racked with sobs as she clung to Brian and Michelle. They held her close, offering what comfort they could. It was in these moments of shared sorrow that Brian and Michelle made a life-changing decision. They decided to adopt Clara so that she would not be taken to an orphanage. The decision was made with a blend of resolve and compassion, knowing that they could provide her with the love and stability she desperately needed. In the days that followed, Brian and Michelle worked tirelessly to make their home a place of comfort and safety for Clara. Her room was filled with warm colors, soft blankets and toys that they hoped would bring some measure of joy back into her life. Slowly, the shadows of grief began to lift, and Clara's smiles, though tentative at first, became more frequent and genuine. Meanwhile, Brian also sought out the young boy who had filmed the crucial evidence. He found him near the same bar, which now stood abandoned. The boy, no longer working at the bar, was initially wary when Brian approached, but Brian's expression was one of gratitude, not hostility. Hey, can we talk for a minute? Brian asked gently, trying to put the boy at ease. The boy nodded, his posture tense but his eyes attentive. Sure. Brian took a deep breath, wanting to convey his sincere thanks. I never got your name. I'm Brian. The boy hesitated for a moment before replying. I'm Alex. Alex, Brian repeated, committing the name to memory. I just wanted to thank you. What you did, it saved us. How did you manage to contact my wife to give her the flash drive? Alex shifted slightly, then explained. On the day the Mexican threw the beer at your wife, she dropped her business card on the floor. I picked it up after you left. I knew it might be important, so I kept it. When I realized I had evidence that could help, I called her number and got in touch with her. Brian was pleasantly shocked. He hadn't realized the small detail of the business card could play such a significant role. That's incredible, Alex. You really came through for us.
Alex shrugged modestly, but there was a hint of pride in his eyes. I just did what I thought was right. Brian smiled, feeling a surge of gratitude and admiration for the young boy. You did more than that. You showed courage and integrity. How would you like to work at my marketing company? The pay is good and I think you'd be a great fit. Alex's eyes widened in surprise and gratitude. I'd love that, he replied, his voice barely above a whisper. The opportunity represented a new beginning, a chance to escape the shadows of his past. As Brian and Michelle integrated Clara into their family, and Alex started his new job, a sense of normalcy and hope returned to their lives. The memories of the past, though painful, became a testament to their resilience and the strength of their bond. The closure of the bar stood as a silent witness to the justice that had been served, and the community slowly began to heal. With time, Brian's marketing company thrived, and Alex, now a young man, proved to be an invaluable addition to the team. Clara flourished in her new home, her laughter filling the house and bringing a light that had been missing for so long. Each day brought new challenges and new joys, weaving together a tapestry of healing and growth.